everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Michael Sierra Arevalo. Uh, he is the author of the book, The Danger Imperative, um, a book on policing. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, David. Happy to be here. Um, so how did you get into researching the police system? So like uh, is common for many people that enter the world of uh, professional research through graduate school, I had an idea of what I was going to do. And then life took me in a very different direction. So I initially went to graduate school to study street violence, so specifically gangs, um, street groups. And so I landed in New Haven, Connecticut, immediately got involved with something called Project Longevity, which is a fo focused deterrence um, violence reduction initiative. And they were piloting it in New Haven. And my job was to sort of be, a, at the very beginning, a note taker, very basic researcher, data collector, and that eventually grew to doing an evaluation of the program. But in between the first day that I started and eventually publishing that evaluation, we did what are called group audits. And these group audits are very high tech. It involves essentially markers and maps. And you sit down, in this case, it was, was with officers from the Haven Police Department, and you try to gather information about groups that are on the street. Um, and that's the first time that I met police officers in a non-enforcement context. Uh, and I was simultaneously struck by how special their job seemed to be. They were talking about shootings and homicides, and they could name street corners and numbers and street names. And yet they were just dudes. They were overwhelmingly white. They were mostly, um, they were all male, I believe, in this particular case. Um, you know, they had big shoulders and chest and arms from the bench, and they had, you know, tattoos and but other than that, they were just very mundane. They were very normal people. With they were talking about overtime and vacation and their kids, and that that stood out to me. Uh, but I wasn't focused on police yet, and that changed in 2014 when Michael Brown was killed. So I am part of a whole generation of now scholars uh, who were in graduate school. They were in training when Michael Brown was killed, and that shifted my focus away from violence what we call community violence, to police violence. And I began to ask similar questions, which is the how and the why of violence. Just this time I was thinking about police. And uh, in short, uh, I discovered, as anybody who studies policing, that the data is pretty bad. Uh, it's out of date, it's very incomplete. Keep in mind, this is 2014. So this is way before Washington Post put together the counted data set that we now kind of take for granted, which tells us how many people are fatally shot by the police. Uh, and so I would thought that, well, if I'm going to answer my questions about how and why, I don't think I'm going to get it with a survey. I don't think I'm going to get it with police data on arrests and incidents and stops. I think the only way to answer those questions is to get in the car. And that's what I did. And so over the course of four years, I spent over a thousand hours in the field uh, with officers in three police departments, Elmont on the East Coast, West River on the West Coast, and Sunshine in the Southwest. Uh, interviewed over 100 officers to understand the how and why of their work, and specifically how threat and danger shapes how they understand and practice police work. So have we, and maybe we isn't the right pronoun, but I'll, I'll go with we, have we overstated the threat that police officers actually face on a regular basis? I guess it depends on who we is. <laughs> um, and, and we is very general. Um, so keep in mind, when I began this project, uh, this was right at the moment where the phrase, the war on cops, uh, arose into the public zeitgeist. And so that was something that was, I think you could credit the rise of that phrase to a book written by the title, The War on Cops, by Heather McDonald. She's a lawyer turned, I don't know, call it pundit. She's not a researcher by any stretch. And the argument of the book is pretty general. And so it's uh, it's sort of pointing a lot of fingers. And the gist of it is that um, ignorant academics like myself and liberal politicians and an ignorant public and Black Lives Matter activists have created an environment that is ripe for causing increased violence against police officers. 
Um, that's the gist of the argument. And this is spurred in part by the, the daylight assassination of two NYPD officers, Wen John Liu and Rafael Ramos, at the close of 2014, by a man who explicitly stated that he was angered by the police killings of Eric Garner and Michael Brown. Um, turns out that particularly if you look at the data from 2014 to say around 2020, this is just not borne out in the data. There is no skyrocketing increase in the rate of officers shot or officers killed. Um, there have been recent fluctuations um, in, that tend to go in line with broader increases in violence that we saw from 2020 till around 2021, 22. Uh, and that's developing work. Um, but the claim that we are at a time where there is unprecedented danger against police or that police officers are killed at uh, a rate uh, in this country that is just blood in the streets is just not accurate. Um, each one of those deaths is very real and it's very tragic. We just had police week uh, like a week ago. And so the danger is real. And to be very clear, policing in the US is more dangerous than policing in say the UK or policing in Germany or policing in Australia. We have more guns than people in this country and officers are shot at a rate here higher than the general public and definitely higher than cops in other countries. But those two things can be true. It can be true that it is more dangerous here for police. And also it can be true that it's still a very rare phenomenon and there is no evidence of this skyrocketing war on police. Now, one of your concerns in your book is the claim that police are more focused on protecting themselves than the public. Can you explain mm -hmm. this? Sure. So I think this is one of the more uh, prickly topics within the book. Um, and to be very clear, there is no training that I observed or documents that I reviewed, which explicitly states um, that you will privilege your safety over that of a civilian, if we're going to use that term, a non-police officer. But it turns out that in practice, that is precisely what police do. Now, we can focus on things like shootings, and there is value to focusing on these incidents, these lawful but awful shootings. But keep in mind that shootings are one of the rarest things that happens in the context of police work. Uh, it's a fraction of a fraction of 1% of these interactions uh, between police and the public that results in a shooting. And a fraction of those are of unarmed people or people that end up to be innocent. Um, but the danger imperative, which is what I write about in the book, this frame of thinking about everything is a potential threat, everyone is a potential threat, there is no such thing as a mundane or normal interaction, everything could spiral out of control at any moment, uh, that cuts across the full spectrum of policing. And so even in the much more normal or much more uh, average interaction that involves violence, grabbing somebody, pushing somebody, handcuffing somebody, punching somebody, the danger in pair is operating there too. And it's very much the case that officers regularly will err on the side of caution, even if that leads to emotional distress on the part of the public or injury in the name of keeping themselves safe. Um, but the more, I think, shocking examples of this, of how this logic can span out of control is when you hear officers, as they told me, uh, better to be tried by 12 than carried by six. And what that means in practice is that officers are saying, I would rather make a mistake, shoot somebody who was innocent, who didn't have a gun, who wasn't a threat, and face a jury of my peers, 12, then fail to take decisive action to protect myself and end up being carried by six pallbearers. At the core of that is actually that assumption that, you know what, my safety and my life is something that I'm willing to potentially kill an innocent person to protect. And that's not ever explicitly stated in documents or in trainings or in policies. But officers do very much view the world this way. I was told this explicitly multiple times. Uh, one of the analogies I love to point out um, comes actually from uh, one of the older Star Trek uh, series. And, and there's this um, episode in Deep Space Nine where uh, one of the commanders is put on trial for uh, basically killing what turned out to be a, uh, a, a faked um, a civilian ship uh, mm. that was destroyed in the middle of a battle. And, uh, you know, he ends up 
uh, getting acquitted because it was, it was fake. But the captain at the end kind of dressed him down and said, hey, look, you made a, a military decision. Um, and and um, sometimes, you know, you can't do that in this line of work. You got to mm. uh, you got uh, you got to take uh, into account everything. And sometimes that means you're going to uh, fail in your mission. And sometimes that means you're going to lose your life. But it, you got to be able to make that decision. And it seems mm. like police officers in a democracy are very loath to kind of take that that sacrifice. So I think one thing that I do want to emphasize is that these ideals that policing very often trumpets honor and valor, and sacrifice and courage, those are real things and real officers show those things. Um, you can just give it a Google. You can find all sorts of instances in which an officer has very clearly laid their life on the line or risked life and limb to pull somebody out of a burning car uh, to try and disarm somebody who was armed, those things do happen. And I'm not denying it. And anyone who does deny it is, I don't think, being particularly honest about those heroic acts that do happen. But, and it's an important but, um, I think it's also naive to believe that those acts represent like the average officer um, or that they represent the average interaction. Uh, most of policing never comes to light. Most of policing is not especially heroic or sacrificial. It's regular people doing a particular job in the same way that some doctors are heroes. Most doctors are pretty average people uh, who are just doing their job. Um, and so I think that the way that police approach their work such that they, in practice, are constantly thinking about how to keep themselves safe and thus in practice often putting the well-being of the public, whether it be in a witness or an innocent person, a bystander or a suspect second to theirs, um, that's a reflection of a system that we've built. Graham v. Connor is a highly consequential Supreme Court decision that tells officers that their use of force should be dictated by what is reasonable. Uh, reasonableness is never defined. Um, and it explicitly says that it's about what an officer perceives in the moment. It should be about something that is objectively reasonable, articulable facts, given to the totality of the circumstances. But in practice, officers are actually empowered to make mistakes as long as they essentially do so based on something that they can observe. Um, that is not necessarily a reflection of an immoral officer. That's a reflection of a system that's actually working exactly as it was designed to work. But there's also a consequence to that. Um, mm -hmm. And so you take um, the book by Rosa Brooks, Tangled Up in Blue, mm -hmm. and, you know, she's fall, uh, she actually becomes an officer. And, um, you know, there's the scene toward the end where the kid jumps out of the dark room. And uh, fortunately, uh, she didn't fire the shot. But they're trained to almost fire that shot if they mm. don't know what's coming out uh, in the dark. And it would have been a horribly tragic thing to have happened, but it probably mm. would have ended up being lawful. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's, that's, an, that's a, an example of what are you know frequently termed these lawful but awful shootings um, or lawful but awful uses of force. And I think this is something that uh, it happens for most people that begin to to read about policing and pay attention to policing. Uh, they come to realize that what the community wants, what the public expects or believes they want police to do um, is not necessarily all that important for what policing does. Policing operates with tremendous discretion and autonomy. And so even though the average person might look at a police shooting and think, I can't, I don't understand why they did that. That seems so plainly excessive to me. If you understand the danger imperative and you understand the laws and policies that energize and maintain that way of understanding the world, I have these, these, these uncomfortable conversations with colleagues and students all the time, which is, yeah, I think that was awful. I think that you know, I think that it was bad tactics. I think that they could have done a whole bunch of things different, but I'm pretty sure that that's going to be found to be legal. 
Uh, and that is a, a really unfortunate equilibrium in which we find ourselves, which is that even egregious uses of force, examples of police violence that the public can even roundly agree are problematic, uh, the, the table is very much tilted in favor of police being able to uh, justify that and have it be found reasonable in a court of law. So you got into this through Michael Brown, and mm -hmm. uh, which I find interesting. Have you kind of changed your view on things after, you know, being in the field and doing these interviews? When you say things, what do you mean? For instance, your reaction to Michael Brown, is it different now than it was in 2014? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So the report on Brown, uh, the report on Ferguson, but also the report on Michael Brown's death um, came out after I entered the field. Uh, and so, and again, this was like one of those uncomfortable things when I talk with colleagues is that the narrative of the hands up, don't shoot, uh, after the investigation was completed, it is not actually apparent that that happened. Now, it could be that a witness um, was scared to testify and didn't want to go on the record. There could be reasons why, but the idea that it's actually as simple as um, a completely non-resistant suspect with their hands in the air being assassinated, murdered by an officer, that is, there is good reason to believe that that's not what happened. Um, it doesn't change that the call for police accountability and reform is important. Um, and so I think that what I've found is that officers that I've spoken to are very quick to use the fact that the initial reporting of hands up, don't shoot and Michael Brown's death in Ferguson was inaccurate as a way to undermine the entire project of, account of trying to find police accountability and transparency and reform. Um, and I don't agree with that either. I think that if, if anything, it's taught me that the underlying problems are very, very real, um, regardless of the particular political or journalistic narrative that emerges at time one, we find out more at time two. It doesn't mean that police brutality isn't real or that it isn't a problem. This happened to be a spark. This happened to be the reason that some people began to pay attention. Um, and I think more importantly, when you look at the police response in Ferguson, whether or not it was hands up, don't shoot, I think what we saw in terms of the highly militarized response, the highly coercive response from police, um, police made a decision about how to do that. And that's when we began to see all this reporting on the 1033 program, militarized policing and protest policing, all of that is still true. And so I think my view on Ferguson as an example um, is often that these stories are complicated. Um, but it's important to keep a sense of clarity about what it is we're talking about. We're talking about police brutality. We're talking about racial inequality. We're talking about systems that span a century and change. This is not about a single person killed by the police and the specific circumstances in which that happened. And, and I think that's kind of the biggest lesson is that it's never a stable person that's just happened to be killed by the police. There's always this kind of uh, dilemma. Like I was just doing a podcast uh, where a family um, lost their loved one in December of 2020. So six months after George Floyd, and it was the same thing. It was, uh, you know, uh, you know, they held the, the guy down for, for 10 minutes uh, prone. Um, and, you know, what, what happened? Well, you know, it was a mental illness call and the police didn't handle it well. And so what happens? It, it evolved to this. And, you know, you almost never get these things where some innocent dude is walking down the street and just some cop just shoots him, right? I mean... It's always a complicated situation, which I think makes it harder because it makes it harder to figure out what went wrong and it makes it harder for both sides to kind of see how to fix it. So I, um, I take your point that the idea that an officer simply draws his weapon and shoots someone walking for absolutely no reason is something that's incredibly rare. 
Um, but I also don't think it's accurate to to make the claim that there's like there's always like a good reason you can understand. It's it's not it's not true. Um, we can look at cases. We can look at cases. Um, most recently, Roger Fortston uh, was in his home practicing his legal right to carry a firearm in his home. Opens the door because an officer is there. Officer immediately guns him down in his own home. Uh, we can look at the killing of Walter Scott. Uh, that's a case in which there was a, a traffic stop. Walter Scott was trying to run away. The officer shoots him in the back and then plants a taser on him. There are, and there's there's a bunch of cases. We can look at the, I want to say it's the McLean case in Colorado. A uh, kid is walking down the street. Uh, people think he looks out of place, looks weird. And by the end of it, he winds up dead. Um, they administered essentially a sedative. Um, he was, he actually was just walking down the street. And no, he was not shot by the police. But he did die uh, as a as a result of being contacted by police and then later paramedics. And so it is certainly the case that these situations can be complex. They can be very tense, uh, to bar the language of Graham v. Connor, tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. But I do think that it's a mistake to assume that there's always like a pretty good reason for why this happens. That's not necessarily true. Um, and we should keep that front of mind. These cases should be treated case by case. Um, but again, treating things case by case, we can begin to miss the forest for the trees here. There's a long pattern. We know what the trends are. We know what the disparities in police use of force generally, as well as shootings are. And people in my line of work are the ones arguing about context or structure and all these other things. But I don't think that we should begin to dive into context to the point of losing sight of very, very robust patterns and how police violence is distributed across space and across race. Um, so you conducted over a hundred interviews, over a thousand hours on patrol. What was the most surprising thing that you learned? Uh, so my pithy answer is just how, uh, how different police work is from how officers often talk about it, um, or at least how it's portrayed. And so I think particularly if you're going off of what you see on cops or end of watch or movies, which is what, you know, most people who don't grow up in heavily police communities, that's their that's their view into what policing is or the nightly news, which is just all murder and mayhem. Um, it is wildly boring. Uh, it is a lot of driving around in circles. It's a lot of hurrying up and waiting in a parking lot because you're waiting for the detectives to get there. Uh, it's looking for shell casings in the dark, in the underbrush. Um, it's a lot of paperwork. It's all the stuff that doesn't make cops. It doesn't make the police procedurals. Um, and alongside that, it's just a lot of suffering. Um, I think I was surprised by just how crushing the average day can be for an officer. So it's usually either boring or boring mixed in with having to deal with mental illness, substance abuse, broken families, the, the symptoms of a system that has systematically disinvested um, from particularly minority communities. Um, police officers very often are acting as priests, social workers, uh, would-be fathers, providing advice, sometimes punishing people, like informally and wagging a finger. That's what most of policing is. Um, but the way they talk about it and what you see on the recruitment videos is it's just it's like gun battles and car chases and like those things do happen but they are such a rare phenomenon in the in the full scope of what policing is um i think that that sort of mismatch was very surprising um but i think also what surprised me is just how robust and consistent the danger imperative was across places i went to three different cities and sure the stories changed the officers that are commemorated uh, in tattoos or in plaques or in pictures, that changes. The policies are a little bit different. On the South uh, in Sunshine, they talk about the border as a source of danger, whereas on the West Coast, it's much more about gangs. On the East Coast, they point to the NYPD all the time and all the things that the NYPD deals with. But at the center of it, it was always danger. It was always threat. That was remarkably consistent across three departments. And I think I was surprised by just how consistent it was. Yeah. I mean, my impression, having been on tons of ride-alongs, is, is the boring aspect that you don't realize just how much of policing is driving around in circles, waiting for something to happen, waiting to get a call. 
And I, I'm always joking with the police officers, like, hey, just bring me along. Nothing will ever happen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it seemed like that at times. I, I saw a few things. But um, but I, I guess the other question I have is, you know, violence is a major component of all aspects of police culture. Why is that the case? And, and what can be done about this? I mean... It, it it seems to me watching um, a lot of cases that go to trial mostly that there's a mismatch between the skills that most police officers have and what most police officers do on an mm-hmm. everyday basis. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do we fix that? All right. So there's two uh, sort of two big questions there. One is so like why is violence so central? I think was one of them, and the other one is. Um, because it's so central, they tend to emphasize violence a lot in terms of their training and policies, but they do a bunch of stuff that has very little to do with violence. But that's what I heard as your as your question. So how do we change that? Yeah. Um, so I think the first thing, it's an important thing to recognize. Like officers are not the only people. Policing is not the only institution that considers the possibility of violence um, and takes it into account. Uh, I work at a university. The university uh, considers the possibility of things like an active shooter on campus. There's there's policies and procedures in place for that. Notably, they also have a police department that is going to be the body that goes and directly deals with that. Um, but you'll see similar things in a hospital setting. Um, and just generally, if you want to think about the U.S. context, a lot of people that conceal carry firearms have something very similar to the danger imperative. Uh, they they believe that the world is full of threats. They are going to take steps to provide for their safety, the safety of their family. So they're going to carry a firearm and do training. The difference, of course, is that policing is funded by the state. And so my tax dollars, your tax dollars, uh, with relatively little input from taxpayers themselves, uh, is directly funneled into policing to arm them, to train them, uh, to create policies, all sorts of stuff. And so what we're talking about here is the power of the state and state resources to perpetuate a particular vision of an institution and by extension, a particular version of that culture. And so the reason why it's so central is because it's at every level of the police department. It's in the academy. It's every day they go to line up and they get, uh, it's called a rundown, a, a roll call sheet or a hot sheet, where they just tell you about all the violence that happened in the city in the prior shift. They crowdsource information on violence through um, what I call the threat network in the book, but it's essentially built on the Department of Homeland Security's fusion centers which is transmitting information about threats to officer safety, weapons, gangs, whatever, all over the country, all the time, such that you can make a clear case that a threat to officers anywhere is a threat to officers everywhere. And then it's when you go on patrol, when you see officers behaving in a way that is designed to keep them safe at all times. And so you're actively performing this culture. That's why it's so central, because it's intended to be central. It's built that way. Um, So what does that mean for doing something different, I will say that I am increasingly skeptical of our ability to introduce, you know, the right mix of training. We just get the training curriculum right, we can fix this. Or, oh, if we just hire more Black officers or more women or more Latino officers, that, you know what, we're going to change policing from the inside. Um, I don't think that's ever worked. Uh, Policing has been, for example, stubbornly at about 13% women for the better part of 35 years, despite efforts to change that. Um, I think that I I want us to begin to have a more serious conversation about understanding that policing is violent. That is actually the point of the institution. Um, They are supposed to be the or else of society. There's a reason you call them. It's because they have the power to make somebody do something, either make somebody stop doing something, make somebody move their car. You can imagine all the scenarios that you call the police because, you know, I don't want to get in a fight with this person. But like, here's a whole body of people that I can call and they got guns and they got like a bunch of them and they can make maybe make this person do something. Um, So if you took away the violence, it just it wouldn't be policing. That's the whole reason the institution works, because they can threaten to use or actually use it. And so I'm more interested in having police do less. Uh, I would like there to just be fewer police public interactions generally. Uh, I would like for police to not be taking reports of cold burglaries. I don't know why police officers are taking traffic accident reports. I don't know why police officers 
uh, are taking me to calls when I went to in West River where a kid didn't want to go to school and three units are on scene. Why? Why are the police here? There's no there's no reason for this. Um, I think that this gets to conversations around alternative response. It gets to conversations around uh, taking care of mental health infrastructure to essentially reduce the number of things that police have to deal with. Um, and more generally, I'm interested in uh, interventions that can reduce violence for everybody, officers included. And so that's going to be things as simple as improving lighting, greening vacant lots in the facades of buildings, planting trees, increasing mental health centers. All of those things will make streets safer, not just for the communities that live there, but for the police to patrol those streets too. Um, finally, you know, um, have you had discussions with police officers about kind of your observations and 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 you know seeing reactions to the book? I, I'd be curious to know how they responded to your book. Yeah, so for better and for worse, I've been talking and writing about the danger imperative for the better part of a decade at this point. Um, and so over the course of the project, officers that I wrote along with, for example, might reach out because they saw an op-ed or they saw a draft of a paper or something. And um, most recently, the book is out. And so people who are uh, who I've never met directly before, um, they're reading the book and there's a mix of reactions. Um, I think that the most common reaction from a critical uh, officer that doesn't uh, agree with my analysis, it's not that what I'm describing isn't real. Um, I think that they see that what I'm describing as something that's reflected in reality. I think what they disagree with is my argument um, that this is maybe not the way that it needs to be. Um, I think for those officers, they believe the danger imperative and the associated set of behaviors and cognitive or perceptual strategies that officers use to stay safe are necessary. And that if they didn't do those things, it would lead to more dead cops. Um, and so they can point to, and usually officers can, particularly if they've been on for a long time, they can point to a time that this person, I got a bad feeling about it. So I, according to my training, I did what I was supposed to do. And you know what? I found a gun. And if I hadn't done what I was trained to do and treated this person as a threat, that might've been my life. Or they can recount a time where someone did shoot at them or a friend that was killed in the line of duty. They can point to these things that for them is the thing that proves that this is necessary. Um, and so for them, the statistics on mortality are not that important. The statistics on the likelihood of being killed during a traffic stop are not that important. Keep in mind that even if the probability is low, it's not zero. And they are mathematically correct in saying that it could be any call. It could be any stop. And the cost of being wrong for officers is infinitely high. It's their lives. And so I think for them, the people that disagree with sort of the conclusion or the argument um, they point to the idea that, sure, I know the probability is low, but if I get this wrong, I'm going to die. And I'm not willing to take that chance. I have a family. I got, you know, mouths to feed. I can't take that chance. Uh, and then there are officers on the other end of the spectrum who I think have read the book. And it's particularly officers that um, have had a longer career. And they remember a time uh, where things weren't so dire uh, in the context of policing and violence and danger. They remember a time where uh, the emphasis on the sort of like tactical nature of policing and the emphasis on threat wasn't so baked into everything that police do. And those officers say that I saw it happening in my department. I saw it happening in front of me. And I'm glad that somebody has put a name to what was happening what and what is happening today. And so it's been a mix. It's been a mix of reactions. But I do think, um, and I'm very happy to report that Nobody can say that it's not real. Um, and so, you know, kind of to close this out, how do you reconcile these kind of two different perspectives or do you? I don't think we need to reconcile them. Um, I think that with any claim or any argument, um, you're allowed to disagree with it. And you can, again, argue, for example, the danger imperative is necessary. Um, and in fact, I don't ever say that the danger imperative doesn't assuredly save some officers' lives or prevent a situation from escalating further than it did. And I write as much in the book. I say that. But that's not the same thing as saying that there are consequences to this culture 
the associated training, the policies and the behaviors. There are dire consequences that actually don't particularly accord with values of democratic policing, with ideas of respect and, and voice. Uh, they don't particularly accord in terms, uh, it turns out, with officer safety. Uh, one example that I talk about in the book is officers frequently don't wear their seatbelts. Why? Well, because they want to be able to reach their gun if they need to or quickly jump out of the car. That is actually a behavior justified through the danger imperative that makes no sense. It is actively getting officers killed when they plow into a tree or a light pole or other officers or an innocent motorist. And so I think that the critique of my argument can stand. But I think that that's not the same thing as making a compelling case that the negative consequences of the danger imperative are also very real, are largely unconsidered in policing and should be cause for reconsidering how we are actively recreating a policing institution that in the name of safety perpetuates inequalities in police violence, actively endangers the public and even undermines officer safety. All right. Well, we've been talking with Michael Sierra Arevalo on the danger imperative. Thanks, Michael, for uh, coming on and uh, sharing your work. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, David. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, so the danger imperative, violence, death, and the soul of policing is available on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. If you do pick up a copy, and I hope you do, please leave a review. You can also contact me at www dangerimperative.com and uh, do check it out. There's a sneak peek in there. Pictures that are not included in the book are on the website. I hope you stop by. Thanks. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mousequake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com.